So again, our, um, our sermon series is Revolutionary Change, and today I have entitled the message, Believe It. Last week we all agreed uh, that God can change anyone. I want to continue that theme today. Uh, we said last week that we're justified. We're freed from the penalty. We're being sanctified. Uh, we're being freed from the power, and we will be glorified one day when we get to heaven. And that means we'll be freed from the presence of sin. It's a revolutionary change that the Holy Spirit brings about in the hearts and lives of those who believe in God's Son, Jesus. So, if you are a believer today, could you say with me, I'm still free. I'm still free. Amen. Believe it or not, I'm still free. God can change anyone. You can just check out uh, examples of that in the Bible. People God changed, and maybe the most powerful testimony, like we said last week, and we're going to continue this week, of a changed life, happened on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. So turn there if you would. Uh, there in Acts chapter 9, we encounter a brother named Saul, who encounters Christ on that road, and he becomes eventually the Apostle Paul, who does more for the kingdom outside of Jesus than anyone in the history of our faith. Saul, or Paul, is our example today that God can change absolutely anyone. So, as you're journeying with me there, I want to take you and look at this familiar passage in Acts chapter 9. And it's my prayer, as familiar as it is, that it will speak to us in an unfamiliar way. And we're going to drop in just after that conversion experience. Acts chapter 9, and we're going to begin at verse 10. Acts 9, verse 10. In Damascus, Paul has had an encounter. He's been on the way to Damascus to persecute Christians. Now, verse 10 says, In Damascus there was a, a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. Which, by the way, you can still go there and see Straight Street today. And Damascus is one of the most ancient cities. In the entire world. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Stray Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Verse 13. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man, all of the harm that he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name. I've chosen him and I'm going to use him to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Verse, verse 17 says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Which, by the way, in Luke's writings, which would be the Gospel and uh, the book of Acts, he focuses on the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people. Verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Now drop down to verse 26. Different setting now. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were afraid of him. This is Saul not believing that he was really a disciple. 
But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, that would be the Jews that would be living out um, side of Jerusalem, out in the uh, other parts of the Roman world that happened to be there in town, or maybe they grew up and they moved there to town. So that, there's, a, there's a, a Hebraic Jew, uh, someone who's more native to the land, and then there are Hellenistic Jews that we read about in the New Testament, uh, people who live out in the Greco-Roman world. They tried to kill him after he debates with them, Jewish people, that is, verse 30, when the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and they sent him back home to Tarsus. Everywhere Saul went, he ran into trouble. Now, I want you to look at verse 26 again. Verse 26 says, when he came to Jerusalem, so he's been in Damascus, now it's sometime later, he comes down to Jerusalem, and he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. Now, do me a favor and tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, today you're going to hear about a change you can believe in. Acts chapter 9 records one of the most well-known accounts of the working of God. It opens with the story of the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus in the first nine verses. And to fully appreciate what happens on that road, you have to situate chapter 9 with the bookends of chapter 8 and chapter 10. In Acts chapter 8 through Acts chapter 10, we find time and time again Luke, the author of the book of Acts, which probably should be called the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit, has set his pen and is focused to share with us the converting power, the changing power of the Holy Spirit. Let me explain. In Acts chapter 8, we encounter some Samaritans, the enemies, the longtime enemies of the Jews. They are confronted with the gospel and they are converted to faith in Jesus Christ. And then after that, we find an Ethiopian eunuch, a man who came from Africa and who is now headed back home. He is also convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit and he is converted. He's changed. And then we get to Acts chapter 9, our text for today, and we see the conversion of public enemy number one, Saul. Believe it or not, he's changed. And then we go on to Acts chapter 10, and we encounter Cornelius, a Roman soldier, who believes and who is converted. And then we run into a story that Luke tells about Peter, who believed that salvation was only for the Jews, and he was hardcore about it. And there's good reason for him to actually believe this. But Peter receives a vision, and it's about lunchtime, and he's dreaming about food. <laughs> Go figure, he's a guy. What else is he going to be dreaming about at noon? He gets a vision, and in that vision, God reveals to him, God changes him, God convicts him, and lets him know that salvation is not just for Jewish people. And then the next scene, we see a bunch of Gentiles gathered at Cornelius' house, Peter shows up to preach, and they all get converted and are baptized. Not only in water, but also by the Holy Spirit. Peter just starts to preach, and the Holy Spirit falls. God does a sovereign move. So what we see is, if we put all of the stories together in Acts chapter 8 through Acts chapter 10, we find that Luke is trying to share one deep theological truth that he wants all of us to appreciate. And that is simply this, that God can change anyone. A Samaritan, an Ethiopian, public enemy, number one. A Roman soldier, a person who's already a believer. <laughs> Can you believe that? Or a group of Gentiles. And that pretty much is just about anyone that you could imagine. God can change anyone. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter how long they've been that way, lived the way that they lived. It doesn't matter how much you do or don't believe that they can change. Luke wants you to know this. When God shows up and the Lord begins to speak and the Holy Spirit begins to move, God can change anyone. As a matter of fact, 
there ought to be at least one witness in this room today who knows that God can change anyone. Who can be honest and acknowledge, I have not always been what I see, I've not always been what you see today, but the Lord found me on my own Damascus road and turned my life around. The Lord has changed me. Do I have a witness? Amen. The Lord has changed three people in this room. So this sermon is for the rest of y'all. I guess. Well, four. Maybe me. I know he's changed me. And that's my point. At least you ought to know that the Lord has changed you. Now, if you don't believe that neighbor that gave a witness, then you need to hang out in Acts chapter 9 and see how the Lord changed Saul. Because sometimes we don't believe that people can change. We can say amen that God can change everyone, but do we really believe it? That's the hard thing sometimes. Sometimes we don't even believe that the Lord can change us. And that makes it hard for us to believe that the Lord can change someone else. But the Lord can change anyone. If you don't know who Saul is, I mean, he's our example for today. You might only know him as the Apostle Paul, the one who did more to spread the gospel and who wrote like 13 books, letters in the New Testament saying things like this, but God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Or therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That may be the only Saul, Paul, that you know. You may come to church today and look around and see only Paul's. But there used to be Saul's in the seat where Paul's are sitting today. You know that Paul, but he wasn't always that Paul. He started off as a brother named Saul, and I would argue that. You cannot fully appreciate Paul if you know nothing about Saul. And if you do not know what went down on the road to Damascus, you cannot appreciate who Paul is now. You have to understand where he began and what he went through to get him to where he needed to be. And I want to pause here and just give you the first point of the sermon. And this admonition as well. Don't allow yourself to be discouraged by the criticism of people who don't know where you've come from and who don't know what you've been through. God can change anyone. That's my first point. Not just that God can change anyone, but that God can not only change, but he can also then choose anyone. God can choose anyone that he wants. If you believe it, say amen. Go on and preach right here, pastor. If you don't know where I started, and you don't know what I've experienced, then you really don't know who I have become. And there's no room for criticism. You don't know where I am on the road. You don't know what God has done in my life to bring me from where I am. But God has chosen me. Just like God has chosen you. Because and I'm living proof. God can choose anyone. Never in a million years did I dream I would ever be doing this. So to understand, back to the message. So to understand, Paul, you've got to know Saul. That was my argument. We first encounter Saul. And there's a lot to be known about this guy. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. We first encounter Saul in Acts chapter 7 where Stephen, one of the first church deacons, is on trial. He's falsely charged of blasphemy just because he believes and is preaching in the name of Jesus. He's brought before um, the religious leaders of the day by a group of people from a local synagogue and he is found guilty and the high priest condemns him to be stoned to death for this blasphemy. The men from the synagogue then drag Stephen outside after he preaches and convicts their heart, the Holy Spirit does, by the words that he says. They drag him outside of Jerusalem to stone him. And when he gets outside the gates, in order to be comfortable, and comfortable in stoning him, of course they take their coats off, their outer garments off. And when they've taken them off, there's only one brother in the crowd that they trust with their stuff, and that's a young guy named Saul. Saul holds their coats as the men stone Stephen to death and he watches. He's so inspired at the stoning of Stephen 
what was in his heart in the first place begins to come out now and he makes it his life goal to persecute other Christians. And he with violence and hatred begins to arrest and persecute Christians. He has become the greatest threat to Christianity in its young infancy stages. No one is more dangerous to the faith of believers than Saul. And when you get to chapter 9, it opens by saying that Saul is still breathing out murderous threats. In other words, ever since the stoning of Stephen, he has been threatening believers. He's led them away to be shackled and even possibly to be murdered. He's out now going to bring other people back from another distant city to Jerusalem to do just that. Here is a man who hates the church of Jesus Christ like no other in his day. And now in chapter 9, he's been given authority by the high priest and the chief priest to arrest not only men, but also women. It's amazing that Luke includes that. But I want to tell you something else about Luke. Luke is all-inclusive in his writing, right? He's a doctor. He has compassion on everyone, and I think that God chose to use him to write these accounts so that we w- it would ensure not that the Holy Spirit couldn't use someone else. But Luke is a, is a natural choice for God to make of a person who has compassion on all people, right? Luke, not only is his focus on the Holy Spirit in his writings, but also on the downtrodden and the outcast and the have-nots. He makes sure that everybody is mentioned. Like Paul, Saul, was not only looking to capture and possibly murder or have murdered men who claim to be Christians, but also women. Everybody, whole families, then will be taken. This is this man, Saul. Here's the man who hates the church. He's been given authority. Here is a brother consumed with anger and hatred for all those who call on the name of Jesus Christ. But God shows up in chapter 9 and begins to speak. And in six verses, turns Saul's life around. Nowhere in Scripture do you see such a great transformation of a life as you do on the road to Damascus. When the Lord shows up, he takes public enemy number one and changes his entire life. Now we believe it. We can say amen to that because it's someone else. And it seems to be easy. We sanctify it, right? Because it's in the Bible. We say it must be true. I believe it, but it's so hard to believe in real life, in real time today. On the road to Damascus, God convicts Saul of his evil evil ways. He converts Saul to be one who is now a believer, and he commissions Saul to go out and to spread the good news. You need to stop and rewind that, because we read right over it. We sanitize it. We forget. The one who was a persecutor is now a preacher. The one who was an enemy is now an evangelist. The one who was antagonistic is now going to be an apostle. The one who was killing people who called on the name of Jesus is now calling on the name of Jesus himself. God has changed someone. And it's not just someone. This is the one who has a deep hatred for Jesus Christ and everybody is afraid of him, and everybody knows what he's capable of. So now let me pause and give you point number two right here. Not only can God choose and change anyone, but God then can use anyone as well. God can choose and change anyone, but he can also use anyone. If you believe it, say, I believe it. Okay, thank you. Boy, you guys are... Man, you're a quick study. All right, I like that. I I don't want to get off here, but I was saying something to Pam last week after our sermon because, you know, there was some interaction, and I like some interaction, but I don't need interaction. She said, well, Joe, you never stop to give anybody a chance to say anything else. Hey, I'm not depressed. I don't need need your help. I'm in a world all of my own. But it is nice to know that you're, that you're with me and that you're hearing the words that God has prepared for all of us today. And I guarantee you that the Lord works on the preacher more than he works on the parishioner when the preacher is working on a word for that week. 
Once God decides to choose and then use Saul as a preacher of the good news, it's important because if we had to vote on him, <laughs> we would not license him at all for a second for ministry because we know who he was and what he used to do. And so often, you know this is true, brothers and sisters, we disqualify people from being used in the kingdom because we think we know what their issues are. Oh, they still have issues. And if we know those issues, then are we denying that God can really change anyone? If you got that spirit, you may not read your Bible, you must not read your Bible very well at all because I come to tell you that everybody that God chooses and everybody that God uses has some kind of issue. You know that to be true, but God uses them in spite of that issue. Jacob was a con man, but God used him. Moses was a murderer. Rahab was a madam. David was an adulterer. James and John were gangsters, but God used them. Joe Horner was a none of your business, but God can't even use him. God can use anybody. He can choose, and God can use anybody. Now we know that Paul, this Saul, has been convicted, converted, and commissioned. God wants to use him, but here's the struggle. He's surrounded by people who don't believe that he's changed. He finds himself engaged with those who don't want to, believe that he's changed, who desire rather to hold him hostage to what he was, to refuse to accept that his life has been turned around by God. And watch what happens. In the portion of the text from chapter 9 that we read today, Ananias is spoken to by the Lord. And the Lord tells Ananias, I need you to go find Saul and lay hands on him so that he can receive his sight. People don't believe. That God could actually change somebody. And look what Ananias says in Acts 9.9. 9. Jesus? You mean Saul? I mean, I've heard about him. People have told me how evil that guy is. How much wrong he's done. How much damage he's inflicted on the church of God. And you're telling me that you want me to now go and mess with this guy? You've got to be kidding me. Ananias doesn't want to have anything to do with Saul. But it gets better. Because after Ananias is convinced to go deal with Saul in Damascus by God, the Bible says that then Saul goes down to Jerusalem. So first, Ananias does not believe it. Now, later, Saul goes down to Jerusalem and watch verse 26. He goes to Jerusalem and he tries to join the disciples. Now, don't, want you to, don't miss this. The man who has been killing Christians shows up now at headquarters in Jerusalem and wants to join the disciples. Can you imagine this? Joining the disciples didn't mean that he just showed up and says, hey, I'd like to attend your church. Joining the disciples in Luke's terminology means that this Saul, who's going to be named Paul, puts in an application to be considered one of the originals, right along with James and Peter and John and Bartholomew and Thomas and the others. He shows up and says, hey, I want to be part of y'all. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the scene? The original followers of Jesus gathered in the upper room knowing who Saul is. And they don't believe he's changed. And they get this application saying that he wants to join the leadership of the church. And I am convinced that that was the quickest church meeting that you ever saw. Peter made the motion, James seconded it, and John voted, and he was denied membership because the Bible says they didn't believe that he was a disciple. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe that someone like that could have their life turned around by God, even though he had turned their life around. Whoa. It's pretty hypocritical. Of course, they were scared to death. And we can understand why. My brothers and sisters, when I said to you, God can change anyone, you have agreed over these last two weeks. When I told you that God can choose and use anyone today, you said amen. But if the truth be told, sometimes we're quick to doubt and to disbelieve that somebody could actually make a change that drastic. 
You might believe that that sister you don't know or that brother that you never met, that that kind of change can happen for them. But it's hard to believe in a change, for instance, when it's somebody who you know, and more specifically, somebody who's been your enemy. It's hard to believe in that kind of change. It's hard to believe that God could change somebody who's done you wrong time and time again without a second thought. Spoken evil of you and been ugly to you. If they say they've been changed instinctively, you don't believe it. Your guard is up. And one of the reasons we doubt and we don't believe in the ability to change is simply because we know how difficult it is for us to change our own ways. And so we doubt that God could change anybody else. You know what it's like to have a habit or a lifestyle or a tendency that you just struggle with time and time again. It's so hard for you to change. And that makes us believe that people are who we know them to be and that they cannot possibly, even by the power of God, change. This is what Saul is dealing with. He has been radically changed and no one is believing him wherever he goes. And probably rightfully so. But it doesn't change the fact that God really did change him. It just draws the shade back, shines some light on the fact that in our own hearts, sometimes we really don't believe that God can change somebody else. Sometimes we don't believe that God can even change us. And as long as we believe that, we're justified to live however we want. This is what Saul is dealing with, and it's one of his most deep difficulties in life. Jesus appeared to him. The Holy Spirit convicted him. Then God chose to use him, and he's been changed. He's trying, but the people around him just can't bring themselves to believe it. One of the easiest ways for the devil to frustrate you when God has changed you and you know that God has changed you is to surround you with people who question the sincerity of your change and the change that you're trying to make and who love to hold you hostage to what they knew you used to be and what you used to do. The devil loves to use that tool against you. If you've ever been there, then you understand what Saul is going through with these disciples. Verse 26 says that they were afraid of him and they did not believe that he was a disciple. They didn't believe that he could change. They believed that he was who they knew him to be. The brother who had been persecuting and killing Christians. Now, I want you to make sure that you read this passage carefully because we have a terrible habit. If something is familiar, just to read over it and we don't give it a second thought. So I want us to slow down for a second. And I want to make sure that we read a portion of this passage. In verse 26, get this. They didn't believe, they were afraid, and they didn't believe that he was a disciple. That's verse 26. In verse 28 says, though, that he stayed with them, the disciples, in Jerusalem, and moved about freely. In case you missed it, in verse 26... They didn't believe he changed. But in verse 28, he's one of them. In verse 26, they didn't put any stock in his word that he had changed. Or any report that came to him prior that he had changed. They denied his application. And then in verse 28, all of a sudden, he is one of them. And you have to say, what in the world happened between verses 26 and 28? It's what makes the difference. It's what makes them believe. That Saul has changed. Are you ready? Because this is really deep. You're really going to have to think about this one. Get your pen out if you, if you take notes. What happens between verse 26 and 28? Verse 27. That's what happens between the two. That's where the difference is found. Verse 27. Verse 27 gives us the ways that God proves to the disciples that Saul has been changed. What are the signs then that God is changing me? Like he changed Saul. What is the evidence in my life that it has been turned around? How can you look at someone and know that the Lord must be working on them? All I can say is, once you get the evidence, you better believe it. 
Verse 27 begins with this phrase, but Barnabas. They don't believe he's one of them. Verse 27. Why? But Barnabas. Paul's right there. Barnabas has picked him up on the way to see the big 12. Don't miss this. The reason the disciples now believe in Saul is because Barnabas has co-signed his application to join them. They didn't believe in Saul until Barnabas spoke up for him. So it is the presence of Barnabas and his own testimony. His name uh, is Joseph, right? That's his, that's his given name. But everybody just called him Barnabas because he went around encouraging everybody. So the testimony, the presence of his life with Saul before the disciples now make all the difference. It's the presence of Barnabas in Saul's life that convinces the others that Saul must indeed be changed. Now stay with me because this is important because when we meet Saul first in chapter 9, he's journeying to Damascus with a group of people. Again, we're talking about how we know that God has changed somebody. It's the same method that God used with Saul. We can apply that method. He's journeying to Damascus with one group of people. How can we know? Who are persecuting Christians. He starts off, here it is, with one group, but by the time he gets back to Jerusalem, he's no longer with them. Now he's running with another group headed up by a guy named Barnabas. He's hanging with a different group. Here it is. Here's how you know that a change is happening in my life. I'm hanging with a different group than I did before because the Lord has changed my heart. You see, when the Lord changes your heart, He changes your associations as well. You know a change is happening in my life when I change who I run with. It was cool when I was Saul, but now I'm Paul. I can't run with them now. When we were on the road to Damascus and the light shines and Jesus begins to speak, that crowd, they didn't understand that it was the Lord. Jesus showed up and they didn't get it. But Barnabas, he gets it. He checked it all out. And he says, I know Saul met Jesus. The Lord was talking to him and has called him to be uh, an apostle. You better believe it. And now, when he gets out into the Gentile world, he's going to start going by the name Paul. What's the difference? On one hand, there's a group who cannot discern what God is up to. The group that was with him on the road to Damascus. And then there's Barnabas, who was completely attuned to the will of God in Saul's life. And what I came by to tell you is this. As long as you're hanging with people who don't discern the holy call of God on your life, as long as you're hanging with them, you will never fully make the change. What you need is somebody who believes God can change you. Somebody who discerns that God has changed your heart. That's what you need. When God has touched your life, you need a Barnabas. One of the quickest ways the devil uses to keep you stuck in something God is calling you out of is to surround you with people who can enable your iniquity but not encourage your righteousness. Be careful. Be careful of people who can enable your iniquity, but not encourage your righteousness. You, I, we need a Barnabas. When we are changed by the power of God, although in and of itself, it's absolutely enough, there are some steps that we need to take to demonstrate this truth, that we are indeed changed. We need to change our associations. Not that we withdraw. We would love to see our old companions saved. But naturally it happens. You start running with a different crowd. When you come to church, I mean this is the paradox of church though. When you come to church, you come to church expecting to encounter a Barnabas. But more often than not, not at this church, I I hope not, more often than not, you encounter someone with a judgmental spirit. You come to church wanting to be encouraged, needing to be encouraged. Somebody who will say, I believe that God has changed you. We all need that whether we like it or not at some point in our life. But more often than not, we come to church and we are confronted with someone who has a judgmental spirit who wants to be critical about what I used to be, hold me hostage to that as opposed to encourage me as to what God has called me to be. When you come to the house of God, you need somebody on your pew who believes that I can be, that you can be more than what you came to church being. 
who can encourage me, who can encourage you to walk in the way of God, to obey the will of God, to live holy, and to introduce you and me to other people who will do the same. Because if we are continually around judgmental people, that's what we will be. As a matter of fact, they flock together. Just like people who will encourage you flock together with other encouraging people. You need to be a Barnabas too. And encourage other people. Is there anybody here that has a Barnabas spirit and who wants to encourage your neighbor to be what God has called them to be? If that's you, tell them this. Neighbor, I came here to encourage you today. Okay, I want to hear some encouragement in the back when we go back there today. Encourage somebody today. The first sign of my heart being changed by God is that I'm hanging with a different crowd. Because you'll never change staying with the same old crowd. But Barnabas goes on then to tell them how Saul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. How can the disciples know? Barnabas shows up and says, look guys, he's hanging with a different crowd. And then he goes on, and you can read it. I didn't read it today, but the first nine verses of Acts chapter 9, Barnabas tells them what happens to Saul. He says he's on the, right, on the way to Damascus, and a light shines, and he falls to the ground. And tradition says that he was riding a horse. And when the light began to shine around him, the horse bucked him and threw Saul to the ground. The problem with that is, is that Scripture never says that he was on a horse. He was walking three times in the book of Acts. That's all we know. Somebody has made that up, and it gives us the impression that this was something, if the horse, horse threw him, that was involuntary. Now, certainly, if a light shines brighter than the sun around you, it will knock you to the ground. That's the glory of God. But Paul still had to comply. The language there indicates that he fell into a posture of worship, realizing that he was in the presence of someone greater, and he did it voluntarily at the same time as he was being knocked to the ground by the light. Isn't that how God works? He shows up in your life so powerfully. He's just waiting for you to submit. That's what happens to Saul in that moment. You think it's involuntary, but it's not. That's not what really happened. He's walking, the light shines, and he falls to the ground. And to fall to the ground is the same Greek word used here as the word humble. So here's what Barnabas says. You can believe in Saul because he's with a different crowd, number one. And number two, because he's been humbled. He's been knocked down. Look at Saul after he's been knocked down, after he falls to the ground. If you keep reading, right, here is this ravenous individual who is bent on destroying other people with all power and authority from headquarters. And now he's blind and can't see. He needs somebody to lead him down the road. He has to fast for three days. He can't eat because he's so weak. And he's waiting for someone else, Ananias, to come and lay his hands on him. The brother who started off with authority and anger and accusations is now lying on the ground blind, needing assistance, needing someone to hold his hand, too weak to eat and waiting on holy hands to be laid on him. He has been humbled. The, world, the word humbled literally means, well, I'll say in some vernacular more common to today, probably 20 years ago now, to recognize that he ain't all that. That's what it means to be humbled, to be knocked down, to have your strength taken, to be made so blind that you can't see how things are going to work out. That's being humbled. To be waiting on somebody to pray for you, to guide you, to help you because you've come to the end of yourself and you don't know which way to turn. When you've been humbled, you've been pulled down out of a place where you think you can navigate life on your own and you're put into a place where you realize that you need somebody or something else beside yourself to help pick you up. Saul was humbled. Barnabas says, guys, you can believe him because he's running with a different crowd and because he's been knocked down. He's gone through something and he's been knocked down. That's how you can know that a change has happened. He's been humbled. Because nothing will change your life more than being knocked down. 
Nothing can change your life more than being blind to what's going on around you and knowing it. Nothing can change your life more than needing somebody to give you a helping hand. Nothing can change your life more than recognizing that you are not as strong as you thought that you were. No matter how much money you have, how much authority you have, life will put you in a place where you need something other than yourself. And when you've been knocked down, that's when change will come. The problem is that there are people who after they have been knocked down, rather than being humbled, they come back arrogant. Now, I don't want anybody looking around the sanctuary right now. They've been knocked down, but to come back, arrogant. They've been knocked down, pushed to the brink of losing everything. The Lord has delivered them, and they walk around full of themselves. They think they made it through themselves. They look back at the past, and they pat themselves on the back. Look what I did. Look how I made it. Look what I've come through. It's all about me. But the purpose of being knocked down, the purpose of being knocked down is for you to look back over what you have come through and recognize, baby, I ain't got nothing to do with my own survival. The only reason that I'm here today is because the Lord has put his hand on my life. The Lord has spared me and brought me through things that I could never bring myself through, not on my own, not in a million years. And now I have no choice but to change. I've been humbled. It was the Lord all along. How do, how do you know that you can believe in my change? It's because I've been through something and I should have lost everything. But I realize that by the saving grace of God, he has kept me in spite of that, even in spite of myself. And I realize that he's been so good to me and he's made ways where there were no ways and because he's held me and because I know that, I have no choice the only proper response is to be changed. Saul is with a different crowd. He's been humbled. Now watch the third thing Barnabas says. Now Barnabas says, and Jesus spoke to him. Listen, Peter, listen, John. You can believe him because he's with a different crowd. He's been humbled. He's been knocked down. And thirdly, he's talking to the Lord. Now he's praying. The Lord spoke to him, and he's praying too. He's talking to the Lord. Now he's praying. Ananias said, Lord, I try not to mess with Saul. God says, don't worry about that. He's praying now. I don't want to go down there. I've heard stories about this guy. I don't want to be within 100 miles of him. God said, don't worry about that. He's praying now. I know what he used to be, but he's praying now. I know his life hasn't been perfect, but he's praying now. I know he's messed up, but he's on his knees. And as long as you're in a, pla in a place of prayer, you can know this. God is working on you. God is working on Saul. He's praying. What the Lord is trying to convey to us is this. No matter what you assume about somebody, never underestimate the power of prayer to change someone's life. That when you pray, the Lord will change you. And I think we need to hear that. Because too often... We get things mixed up and when we start talking about prayer. And people get frustrated in prayer because you pray for 30 seconds that God would give you a new job and then you don't get it. And so now you're upset about prayer. You have to send somebody on TV an extra offering to get that new car. The power of prayer is not to give you what you want. The power of prayer is not to change things outside of you I can't promise that you're going to get a new job. I can't promise that you're going to get a new car. Just because you pray, God may choose to do that. That's not what prayer does in the first place. When you pray, it doesn't always mean that God will change things outside of you. Although he may. That's his prerogative. Certainly he does that on a daily basis for us. But that is not the primary purpose. Prayer changes you. So that when you stay on your knees, prayer changes your mind, prayer changes your feelings, prayer changes your perspective, prayer changes you from the inside out. So that if you're struggling to make a change, there's something that you can't stop, there's something you're trying to get rid of. Something that the Lord has called you out of, but you're struggling with it. Let me give you some simple but profound advice. Pray. 
Pray. Prayer will help you fight every temptation that comes your way. Prayer will convict your heart of the right thing to do. Prayer will change your thoughts over a particular situation. Prayer will help you silence your lip, lips and bite your tongue. Prayer will make you stay at home. Prayer will cause you to send them to voicemail. Prayer will keep your heart stayed on the things of God and off the things that you so desire that can be for your destruction. And when you are tempted, when you want to go astray, when you want to do what you used to do, all you have to do is fall on your knees and pray. Lift your hands and pray. I am a living witness. And I'm going to guess some of you are as well. There is somebody in your pew today that when you call on the name of the Lord, the Lord will strengthen you. The Lord already has strengthened you. The Lord will help you because he already has and you know that he will when you pray. The Lord will hold you up. The Lord will stop you. The Lord will start you. The Lord will activate holiness in your, in your life in the place of unholiness when you pray. That's how good prayer is. The Bible says that Paul is blind, but he's praying. He can't see how things are going down, but he's praying. He doesn't understand a thing that is going on around him, but he's praying. He can't decide who's who or what's what, but he's praying. He's praying, and the Lord says in his prayer, the Lord gives him a vision in his prayer. He's blind, but he's praying. God gives him a vision, a vision of what he's going to be, even when others can't see what he's going to be. What prayer will do is this. Expose who you are and help you to see yourself changed by the power of God before it ever comes to pass. Prayer gives me a vision of what I can't see with my natural eyes. Prayer is like a sealed off renovation site. And all you see is a sign up at the site that says, Please excuse my mess. But you're going to love me when I'm done. I mess, I, I'm a mess right now. I may not be everything that God has called me to be. I am a work in progress. But when I get to the amen of this prayer, and the Lord answers my prayer, you're going to love what you see. That's the power of prayer. I'm different. I'm running with an, another crowd. I went through some things that knocked me down, that humbled me. I'm praying. And then Barnabas says, here's the last reason that you can believe that Saul is changed. He's talking about Jesus. That's all he's talking about. I heard, it, I heard him talking about Jesus myself. All he wants to talk about now is Jesus. Remember when we first met Saul? He was threatening and cursing, murderous, all kinds of language. And now all he's doing is talking about Jesus. It says twice in the text that he is preaching Jesus fearlessly. That's what he's doing now. You can know he's changed because all he's talking about is Jesus. That's in his heart. That's all he wants to talk about. If you have ever been changed by the power of God, you know that to be true, don't you? I hope that you do. If not, God better change you today. It doesn't mean that you deny what's going on in the world around you and you don't deal with business, but in your heart, what you want to talk about is Jesus because he has changed you and he has filled your heart. You know what you came through. You know how he held you up. You have been humbled. You have around you people who will encourage you, I hope. And all you want to talk about is Jesus. One of the real signs that Saul has changed, one of the real signs that I've changed, that you've changed, is that our talk is different. Some things that I used to talk about, I don't talk about anymore. Because i got something else to talk about. You know that I've really been changed when I'm talking about what God is doing in my life and not everything else that has happened to me or that I've done in my life. There's just some stuff when God has changed you that you don't talk about anymore. And the quickest way to identify somebody who is still holding on to who they used to be or where they used to go, or what they used to do, is they're always talking the same old stuff. You know those kind of people. You ask them how they're doing, and some way they find a way to hit rewind and play every conversation about what he did or what she did, how they did this, how they did that to me, blah, 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 blah. In the words of some internet star, ain't nobody got time for that. I just asked how you were. I don't need to hear all that old stuff. 
Just give me that sanctified version. You know, I mean, I mean, I'm just highly blessed, brother. I'm highly blessed, sister. That's me. God has favored my life. Or just hello would also do fine. Don't bog me down. I know that God has changed you if you're living in your past all the time and all of those hurts. God hasn't fully changed your life. Maybe it's because you haven't let him. Maybe it's because somebody hasn't been around to encourage you. Let me encourage you today. If God has changed your life, you don't have to live in what you used to be. If you're given to prayer, God can give you a vision to see what you are not yet. What he desires you to be. That's what you need to press on towards. That's what Paul would later say that he would press on. I put all that old stuff behind me. Man, I had it all. I had nothing. None of that matters. I was great in the eyes of Judaism. I was the next big thing. But I count all that as dung. I'm just going to press on toward the high calling of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what prayer will do for you. It will change your perspective even on Yourself. Prayer changes you. Not always your circumstances. Your talk changes now. He's not only changed the group that he's hanging with, he not only realizes that he's been knocked down and that he is utterly humbled, he's not only praying now, but his talk has changed and he's preaching Jesus. And here's the reason why the disciples don't accept him still. They're afraid. Now I'm going to hit maybe a different note here. They were afraid. They would have preferred for Saul to come back apologizing and bowing down and not putting in his application. Yeah, I was so wrong. I'm sorry. I did you wrong. I was doing the wrong thing. Can you all find it in your heart to forgive me? He doesn't do any of that. He just shows up preaching Jesus. And notice, he never tries to convince Peter to accept him. He never tries to convince John to accept him. He realizes that there are some folk, they will never believe that I've changed no matter what I do. Why waste the time and the energy that God has given me in my life trying to convince somebody else that God has changed me? Trying to prove myself to people who are convinced that I could never change anyway. And you have to resolve this. Don't you know what you think about me can't stop what God is doing in me? Yes, sometimes we need a Barnabas, but then there are some times when you just have to come to the conclusion that perhaps Paul came to here before they accepted him into the group. Don't you know what you think of me can't stop what God is doing in me and your opinion of me does not dictate what God has for me. I need to preach to some adult folk in this place today. It really doesn't matter what you say about me. It doesn't matter what social media is posted about me. When you know what the Lord has done in my life, like I know what the Lord has done in my life and what the Lord has brought me through, you can say what you want. Think what you will. I know that God has called me, that God has chosen me, that God will use me. So listen, let's just go on and talk about some other things. Rather than trying to act like I'm guilty all the time, so that you can say, I told you so, all you want to do is talk about the goodness of God. Why are you dwelling in the past? All I want to do is tell you about how the Lord has saved me now. All I want to do is preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I don't have time to justify my old life before you. I'm forgiven and God is using me now. Because there's nothing better to prove my change than my commitment to talking. Not about my past, but about the glory of God. Because He is in my heart. I ain't got time to explain my past to you. I ain't got time to make you feel like I owe you something because that's what happens. The Lord met me on the road to Damascus, my own road to Damascus. And if that ain't enough, if that isn't good enough for you, well, I guess that's just going to have to be between you and the Lord because I'm done with that life. And now I'm talking about Jesus. When you've been through what you've been through, 
when you reach the place where you're just glad that the Lord is still in your life. And thanks be to God that He is. That He chose you. That He's still using you. That He still talks to you. That He still holds you. That He didn't get rid of you a long time ago. You just keep on talking about Jesus. Because you know He's done that for you. Barnabas says of Saul to the disciples, he's changed, and you can believe it. He's not running with the same folk. He's changed. He went through some stuff. And he got knocked down. He's been humbled. He's changed. He's praying. He's changed. He's changed because the only thing that he wants to talk about now is the goodness of Jesus. God can change anybody. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done doesn't matter if you even believe that you yourself can change let alone if anybody else believe that you can change what you need to know is that when God shows up and the Lord begins to speak and the Holy Spirit begins to move God can change anyone even you and maybe today you need a change in your life so stand with me if you are going through some stuff if there are hateful feelings hurtful things that you're dealing with in your heart that maybe nobody else knows about. If you've been hurt and you can't forget your past and you rewind it all the time. If you need a Barnabas to take your part and to encourage you. If you need a different group to hang out with, to encourage you to live right, it's time to pray. This prayer is for you. And you can be changed. And it's a change that you can believe in, not because of the prayer, not even because of anything that you've done, but because God can change anyone. And the change is revolutionary in our lives. Maybe that's why it's so hard to accept. So I don't know what your issue are, issues are. I don't know what you're dealing with right now. I don't know. Maybe you just need a change in your life. I want to pray for you right now. And I want you to pray in your own heart and ask the Lord to change you. Because that's what he does in prayer. He changes you more than he ever changes your circumstances. He knows what's best for you. So let's just pray right now that God brings the kind of change, whatever it is that you need in your life. And if you need to confess sin, you better do that right now too. Just go ahead and humble yourself. Because if you don't, God will find a way to humble yourself. You can come back arrogant if you want, but you'll be humbled again. You'll be knocked down again. God's not done with you yet. He wants to change you. We're just stubborn. But prayer can change all of us. And so that's what I'm going to do right now. And you need to do the same. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the richness of the story that can be presented in so many different ways about the conversion of that man named Saul who, when he went to the Gentile world, became known as Paul the one we know. Lord, we all have a past. We all have things that we would like to change about our lives that need to be changed in our lives. We all need encouragement. Sometimes we just need to stand up and know that we're always going to have opposition and that we're going to keep on talking about Jesus. We're going to keep on living for Jesus. Sometimes we hide things in our heart that shouldn't be there. Sometimes we're arrogant. Sometimes we need to be humbled, knocked down. Sometimes we just need to pause and pray like right now and to ask for you to change us. Sometimes we need to be an encouragement rather than having a judgmental spirit. Turn our hearts around. Change us, Holy Spirit, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. Shine the light in the dark places of our heart and bring the change that you desire. And may we go from this place changed because you can change anyone. May we go from this place knowing that you can choose anyone and that you can use anyone. And Lord, I pray that everyone in this room and on this campus would be used by God, even with all of their issues, because there's no one that doesn't have issues. God, you can use us despite those issues because you're so great and you can change us. Lord, you never give up on us. Help us not to give up on ourselves. Forgive us. Humble us if we need it. Help us to encourage somebody. Help us to receive encouragement. Help us to be given in prayer. 
and help us to talk about Jesus. We know we're changed. Keep on changing us, Lord, I pray. So that we're changed to the extent that everyone that we meet can believe it. In Jesus' name.